How's it going, everybody? Norman Moktaima. All right, yeah, so, you know, I'm not out in the water. I'm sitting at home. Um, we have fires, we have drought, we have national forest closures. <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of our trips and guiding, uh, as far as the, the out on the water business has come to a halt. And as far as myself, I can't get out in the water and bring you any out on the water tutorials. So I'm sitting here in the office or sitting here at home. I don't have an office. <laughs> my office is outside and I can't get to my office. So in past videos, um, when I'm talking about nymphing ver uh, you know, with a suspension setup versus a tight line euro-nymphing setup, uh, you may hear me refer to my suspension or indicator setup as an inline nymph rig. So I'm gonna go over that with you today and uh, break that down, uh, talk about it, as well as show you how to construct that leader, or at least how I construct that leader. Uh, now with this rig, <clears throat> I utilize this rig primarily when I'm fishing uh, waters that, um, you know, the preferred fly choice of the fish or of the trout is are going to be small weightless nymphs, betas, midges, where you know you get majority of those flies are aquatic insects in what we call a habitual or diurnal drift meaning they just let go of the river bottom and let the current carry them and then they you know swim back down to the bottom so majority of the flies that are available to the trout are going to be in that nice kind of free float or free drift um, just trying to relocate also on the flip side you know we're dealing with current that's fairly slow you know where those flies have maximum exposure time to trout and um, <clears throat> you know when you're dealing with a, a tight line rig or a uranip setup it's very hard to get a nice good drag free natural drift so you know the indicator or the suspension rig is going to allow you to uh, have the current move it along by adjusting depth uh, between your indicator and the weight and as, as well <clears throat> um, adjusting the amount of weight that is ahead of your flies. Now, that being said, there are definitely disadvantages um, when it comes to this rig. Uh, it's very disjointed, meaning you have the indicator, you have the weight, and then you have your flies trailing behind the weight. So you never really maintain maximum contact between the indicator and your flies all the way down to the terminal end fly. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of instances where I've seen fish take the flies before there has been any tension set up between uh, the indicator and your flies. So that being said, there is a lag period of setup time, meaning with, as soon as you deliver the cast, your flies, your leader, everything lays down on the water, there is going to be a time frame or a lapse in time before your flies and everything is connected and you are able to register strikes um, effectively. Really where that disadvantage I find comes into play is when you're in uh, more turbulent, faster moving water where your weight breaks through the surface but your flies are still sitting up here so your weight hits the water, breaks through the surface and your flies are still up here and say the current's moving this way, all of a sudden your flies end up downstream of your weight as it starts to sink. The fish grabs the fly, holds it, spits it and you never know, you know there was any fish on there. And I know this because as a guide, uh, I have watched <laughs> these uh, inline rigs <clears throat> descend into the water column and I've seen the fish take the flies and I'm yelling at my clients, set, 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 set. Uh, and my client's like, the indicator never moved. And I'm like, yes, but when your guide tells you to set, set the hook. <laughs> so I've seen the fish come up, take the flies. Indicators never moved. There was no contact between uh, indicator and fly. So with that being said, you know, you want to pay very close attention to your indicator and uh, set in those situations where the indicator just pauses, hesitates. Right there, right there. 
There you go. <laughs> They're real light on the hit. I mean, that indicator is just going to pause. Okay, so let's get into constructing this leader or getting this set up going. We are just using standard tapered leaders for this setup. Uh, you know, you don't need to build it out. Some great leaders out there. Uh, I'm going to use the Umqua Performing Perform X uh, leader. And we're using the seven and a half foot down to two X. Um, this is a three pack. So I'm going to just try and get one out of this pack and preserve the rest. So, so obviously when you get your leader out, they're going to be coiled like this. Uh, the butt section usually is what's coiling around the remainder of the leader to keep it uh, in place. So I'm just going to go ahead and uncoil the butt section. There's going to be multiple coils. And then eventually you get to a point where it'll kind of just want to spool freely off of itself, uh, just like so. And then always keep that leader though uh, looped around your fingertips and then let it just come off on its own. So now you notice you got the coily butt section all the way down. Uh, usually what I find is, you know, just a stretch is good enough. Uh, it used to be that, um, you know, you want to run it through your fingertips, create friction and all that. I find that that may actually backfire on you and make it coil in the opposite direction or in enhance the curls. So I just tend to grab it and pull, just give it a little bit of tension. And that's usually enough, especially if it's a fresh leader enough to um, straighten it out. So, all right. And with all new leaders, their loops are hand tied. And I know probably, or I'm just assuming the guy's tying or the person tying the knots is in a big rush to get multiple uh, leaders out. So um, there's a little bit of extra tag. You can go ahead and take your nippers, scissors, whatever you got, and you can clean that up. Um, I personally actually tend to retie the loop. That's a little big of a loop for me. Uh, if I can tie it down to a little bit smaller size, that's preferred. I'm not gonna get into that right now. Tip it end, <clears throat> now that I got this all straightened out, uh, it's down to two X and usually you get about a foot, foot and a half or something like that of the two X diameter. I'm gonna chop it back, just uh, take off about a foot. Uh, main reason being is we're gonna add some more to this leader and I don't want it overly long. So I'm gonna go ahead and just cut that back. It's still two X right where this point is. I am actually gonna add about three feet of cider material. Um, now, let me backtrack here a little bit because I do have a video called Fishing the Indie Cider or something like that. And I'll link it up for you guys. Uh, I'll throw it up in the corner somewhere around in here and uh, so you guys can reference that video and basically how I fish that side or how I, you know, it does go through how I set up, but this is a little more in depth. <clears throat> so I'm going to utilize the uh, Rio two-tone cider in 2X. So what we're going to do, again, I cut off about a foot off of my uh, seven and a half foot leader and we're going to run about three feet of this material. Now each color segment, pink, pink, pink. If I get three of those color segments, it gives me about three feet. I'm just going to trim that there. From my <clears throat> tippet end of my leader to my new section of cider material, you can do a, a um, surgeon's knot. Uh, I usually prefer triple surgeons, but being that this is 2x diameter, both material, I'm going to go ahead and do a blood knot. It just gives me a cleaner knot. Uh, so, but again, per whatever you prefer, I'm not going to get into the actual knot itself. I do have another video on knots that I prefer. Uh, I believe that one's called knots to know. Uh, I can link that one too, uh, up in the corner. So got my blood knot set. Boom. I'm going to trim my tags. Uh, you can actually tight line with this. You're not going to get the same, you know, distance as far as the tight line, but if you want to draw it in close and switch out your external weight, uh, your inline setup and run a dropper off of it, you totally can. Uh, so that's not a big deal. And again, I'm going to bring this down. So again, I have my one pink segment, second pink segment, third pink segment. That's going to give me three feet and trim that there. Give me a little bit of room so I can get my trash can. Give me a little bit of room so I can actually um, tie on my tippet ring now. I know Rio, um, Fooling Mill, Umqua, you know, there's all these 
tippet ring providers uh, out there. So uh, whatever tippet ring you prefer, two millimeter, uh, this is one and a half millimeters, um, will, will float if you want this to be able to suspend even dry fly, dry dropper setups too. So I'm not get into all that as well. So <clears throat> always keep it on the little swivel there. Find the one that will come off first. Don't go for the very last one because then you're gonna pull off all the other tippet rings. So I'm gonna thread my cider material. And for this, I do just to uh, improve clinch knot clinch knot again whatever knot you all prefer all right now I got my cider with tippet ring on there so seven and a half foot leader chopped it back a foot so now it's a six and a half foot leader I'm gonna tie on three more feet of 2x so that's 2x 2x cider to my tippet ring and now for my tippet ring I can tie whatever diameter of tippet I want uh, to utilize. So, <clears throat> you know, I utilize this leader set up primarily on the San Juan in the videos that, I sh that I've shown you guys. Um, so from there, I can taper down to, you know, um, whatever, whatever depth I want to run. So let's say uh, where I'm fishing, the average depth is about four feet. I'll just go straight to four feet. Um, so just take four feet of, of tippet. So this is for right now the Deceiver X. Phantom X is great as well. Um, fluorocarbon, obviously being that this is gonna be a nymph rig and your nymphs are submerged, um, you know, gives less stretch, more abrasion resistance, less visibility. And so um, I'm just gonna Clinch knot this one too, improved clinch to the tippet ring. You can trim your tag. So I'm gonna measure that out. So that's about four feet. So tippet ring to my terminal end. I got a little bit of room. I'm gonna splice some tippet on here. And at this point, between my standard setup pretty much anywhere I go, even the San Juan, uh, I run about 12 inches between uh, where this terminal end of my now, which is uh, which is now my leader, this section right here, uh, I'm gonna run about 12 inches. So from this knot, I'm gonna splice on, <clears throat> give my cut myself off probably about 15 inches. That way, I have enough material to work with because one, I'm gonna tie splice here with a triple surgeon's knot. Surgeon's knot. Excuse my nasaliness. It's a little smoky and dusty. Dealing with all these fires and whatnot. So I've got a little congestion. Triple surgeons. Tighten that down. Clip my tags. So this little knot right here <clears throat> from my tippet that connects from my tippet ring down. This knot is where my weight will be placed. Split shot, putty whatever you want to use, um, that's going to help hold it in place. And then really about 12 inches, I will tie my first fly. Tie my fly on, uh, basically just tie on the flies that I normally use when I'm on the, on the one there. So red anilid, typically size 18 or 20 back up real quick. I was talking about the weight right here. And if you're wanting to use weighted nymphs, uh, you don't even have to add this little segment right here to stop your weight. You can just go ahead and tie your weighted nymph directly. You got to remember from your indicator to your weight is going to be the preferred depth that you're trying to fish this rig at. So whether that be split shot, tungsten putty or a weighted nymph itself, that's going to be the depth you're measuring out. Even though you're adding, you know, segments with flies following your weight, uh, that doesn't factor in because those are going to be suspended in the water column at some point, somewhere. You're, you're hoping anyway. So your contact point uh, is going to be between be, be between your weight and your indicator. Go. Let's go ahead and add on my uh, unweighted red anilid. So the knot I'm going to use is uh, actually a non-slip loop. 
uh, that's not in any video tutorial. Maybe I'll put this one out later. Uh, you could probably look it up, just a, a non-slip loop uh, when you're looking at knots to utilize when you're fishing. Um, Nymph there is able to swivel and move around, so that's the benefit of having a non-slip loop on there. Um, <clears throat> now we're gonna go ahead and add on our second fly. And again, I usually try to keep the rig equidistant, meaning uh, the weight to your first fly, 12 inches, first fly to your terminal fly, 12 inches. You know, I'm kind of OCD like that. Uh, it's just a little bit of a balance to the rig. And so one thing you can do is you can go ahead and just tie directly to the uh, hook of the fly. Uh, you can tie to the eye itself. Um, that way you're freeing up the hook completely. Um, for the San Juan, I do notice that if I tie to the hook bend, um, I don't get as many good solid hookups on the red analyte or on this middle fly, on this uh, first fly. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually do another non-slip loop. This can get a little crowded and, and uh, complicated, but I just kind of fold my tippet back uh, along the body of the fly and that'll clear the eye so I can tie another non-slip loop on there. Okay, so I have <clears throat> my new nymph on there, or my new dropper. So what I can do is I can fold it in half from the fly, and then there's my knot down below, so I know that's gonna be the same distance. It's gonna give me a little bit more so I can tie my new fly on there, or my terminal end fly. And let's see, we'll go with a little, this last uh, trip, this last trip that we had was using this little um, light olive. I don't know if y'all can see that little light olive midge. Blackhead, again, another size 20. Non-slip loop, again, just giving these flies a little more freedom of movement. You know, and the knot may protrude, but again, you're looking at those uh, giving your fly as much positive aspect as possible and that little bit of movement in the fly itself, that ability of it to, to swim naturally in the water, you know, will override that knot protruding off of its face. <laughs> okay, now we got our flies set up on here. Now we're gonna add the weight. Um, you know, a lot of you all might be familiar more with um, actual split shot, which come in different sizes. Six, eight, four, I have no idea what those numbers reference because I don't use the split shot. Uh, I use tungsten and putty. Uh, there's a variety of different tungsten and putties out there. Um, you know, find one that you're comfortable with. <clears throat> but basically, it's just, uh, I don't know if you can really see it. There's not much in there right now. I've kind of lost some as I've guided or whatnot. But you can just pinch off a clump. And you can see, you got a little putty piece right there. And usually what I'll do is I'll fold it into a little pancake, just like so. And then we'll find my knot right here. This is where what's gonna stop. So this goes to my leader. These go to my flies. I don't want the putty below the knot to allow it to slide down to my flies. I want it above the knot. That's what's gonna hold it in place. So I can just make that little pancake with my putty, just like so. I'm gonna slide that or put the tippet right down the middle of that little pancake right there. I'm just gonna fold it right over. So I got me a little tungsten taco. <laughs> and with my fingertips, I'm just gonna pinch and roll. If you're a fly tire, you're almost dubbing <laughs> this putty on the tippet. But if you just twist it in one direction, now you got a nice cigar. Now the trick is with this, <clears throat> um, how you roll it on there is gonna make a difference in how quickly it sinks or its effect on the sink. So if you string it out like this, that's increased surface area, right? So it'll actually slow the drift down a little bit more. So you can get that effect. If you want a little quicker sink, just push those little ends together so they form a little bit more of a ball 
and that'll reduce the overall surface area and now it'll sink much faster. It's gonna condense it and it'll just drop through the water a little quicker. If you, again, if you want it to, wanted to slow it up, but you want that, you know, want it to stay down, you got faster moving current, elongate it and that'll help keep it down. Now, if it's just too much weight, no matter what you do, you're just hanging up all the time. The great thing about tungsten putty is I can just peel that off, roll it in one direction, and now I got less amount on there, and so I just reduce the weight. And you can keep doing that or keep adding on just incrementally. It's infinitely adjustable, and that's why I like using the tungsten putty. Uh, it is hard or difficult to really get a, an idea until you start utilizing it more and more, but that is my setup. So tungsten putty, first fly, terminal fly. Now, that being said, I do have <clears throat> four feet between my putty or my weight and my tippet ring. Now, at this point, if I know that's going to be about the average depth of the area I'm going to be fishing, I can just go ahead and add my indicator. Okay, so... <clears throat> As far as indicators, you know, your choice, your preference. Um, I do like airlocks, but that little nut, sometimes you lose them. Or the latest one that has come out, you got the Oros. So what I do like about the Oros is that you can actually swap out the two different colors and create, you know, multicolors. So you see the orientation as it's in the water to adjust your drift, make your mends, that sort of thing. And I'm good, that tippet ring is gonna lock it in place and prevent it from sliding any closer than four feet. So if I need to reduce my distance or my depth less than four feet, I'm not gonna put the indicator on my tippet. I'm actually gonna go ahead and just loosen up my indicator, move that away, and then I'm gonna cut my tippet down <clears throat> in order to maintain my depth between here and there. Because ultimately, if I do cut that and I need to go deeper, obviously I can move my indicator up the cider material to adjust my depth. Uh, it is much more difficult to move it down uh, without you know, getting into this thin 6x diameter and creating another weak spot um, you know, a, apart from the knot and the other knots with your entire setup. So again, like I mentioned, if I wanted to go five feet, I can just move it up about a foot. And with any of these foam, do a little half turn to lock it down because even this is 2X, it's still thinner diameter. If you don't lock it down, these will slide, no matter what anybody says or how tight you tighten it down. Give it a little half turn and then tighten it down, the half turn around the post, and that'll help lock it in place. As you'll see, if I loosen that half turn, unwind it the one time I go, I don't get the super insane kinks that you would see with like a thingamabobber so or you know any other rig where you have to really pinch that uh, tippet material so i can slide this up and down real easily adjusting and fine-tuning my depth uh, the rio two-tone cider has eight inch increments so i can utilize those color transitions you know rather than going five inches six i just go eight inches and then dial it in from there so that's easy enough go up 16 inches, half turn, lock it down, I'm ready to rock. And I just give it a little bit of a straightening just to kind of make sure it is all straight through the indicator itself, and I'm ready to roll. This will sink, no problem. So on top of that, you know, you don't even need this indicator. Uh, you can also take that off, and let's say you want to throw a dry fly or a dry dropper rig. Uh, let's go with the dry fly first. So ultimately what I can do is you got your weight down here. You still have a nice solid taper uh, to help create a backbone in your cast. Just eliminate the weight. <clears throat> let's say you got some betis or bluing olives or whatnot hatching. I got my this stuff all hanging deaf down here. Took my weight off. I'm going to cut it right at that knot. I'm gonna put these to the side. You know, there's all these little rig, rig savers and whatnot. You can just do that, put those there. And then, you know, right at the terminal end where my knot was or my weight was, I'm gonna clean that back because a little bit of um, tungsten and putty residue on there. And at that point, I'm just gonna tie in a dry fly. So a little bigger than a betis, but you know, just so you can see, uh, I can just go ahead and tie on um, my dry fly. 
that's just what I have hanging off my pack right next to me here. So, boom, just a quick switch. Now I got my dry fly on there. I'm ready to go and cast. Uh, obviously with the betas, uh, having that four feet of 6X gonna give you a nice gentle presentation as well as a really excellent drag-free drift um, in your presentation as well. So it should, should um, get you some pretty good eats and, and less refusals. Now let's say if you wanna go dry dropper and really wanna fish a bigger chubby Chernobyl like this, uh, off my tippet ring, I would probably, I would typically run about a foot of 3X, 4X, tie my chubby Cher Chernobyl or my indicator dry fly on there, and then <clears throat> do my dry dropper rig off of that tile. All right, that's pretty much it. You know, you're dealing with a fairly long leader, so just adjust your casting to accommodate that. Open up your loops. Don't be too concerned with nice tight loops that you would normally utilize when you're dry fly fishing. Start low, come over the top. All right, um, that's pretty much it. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, bring you as much as I can uh, in, not out on the water. <laughs> so uh, anyway, thanks everybody. Thanks to my Patreon, Patreon producers. Uh, thanks again, you know, to find me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and my time of fly fishing, as well as YouTube, as well as my Patreon. That's where you can find me. All right, everybody, take care and look out for more videos. All right, peace. Dang, nice. <laughs>